All right, everyone. So my name is Amy. I am an optometrist and today I'll be going through some of the tests that we do at a practice just to go through things like glaucoma, measuring eye pressures and things like that that others um, may not be able to do in other practices. So just moving forward here. Okay. So a lot of people have been questioning about some of the clinical tests that uh, could be done in a clinical setting. I'll quickly go through these um, just in the next couple slides here. So the first one here, as you all may know, is the eye pressure. So what is actually eye pressure? So we call it IOP, um, short for intraocular pressure. The IOP is actually the fluid pressure inside your eye. So specifically, it's the magnitude of the uh, force of the jelly that's inside the eye as it spreads inside the internal surfaces layers. And it can be affected by a few things. So the main few things I've just listed on the slides here. So things like a refractive error, which means your prescription. So if you are short-sighted, uh, you also automatically have smaller eyeballs, which can artificially uh, increase the eye pressure and vice versa if you are uh, short-sighted. Uh, the other thing that um, can affect eye pressure is also the way that it's measured, so the method of measurement. So things like the, um, you probably all remember the air puff uh, machine, the dreaded air puff. The air puff machine is the uh, easiest way of measuring eye pressure in a busy practice setting where I work. It's called non-contact tonometry. Uh, the other methods are involve a little needle that goes onto your eye, which is actually that first photo on the top there. Essentially, they anesthetize the front of the eyes and they put a little needle onto your eye just to measure the eye pressure. Now, this unfortunately is not the most uh, effective or efficient, I should say, in a busy practice uh, just due to high volumes. It's going to take quite long. So yes, the eye pressure we normally measure with that little puff of air. Uh, the other, another thing that can affect eye pressure is also um, diurnal variation. So what that means is the time of day that is um, the eye pressure that is measured. So according to several sort of uh, practices and studies, uh, eye pressures are generally a little bit higher in the morning and they tend to go down a little bit later. And the reason why we actually need to measure these sort of eye pressures all the time when we, you know, do these tests is because we need to set a baseline of pre-treatment values, so pre-treatment eye pressures before we can actually set targets. So according to, again, several research studies, uh, ideally for a, um, a target eye pressure, we would like to reduce it by, you know, 20 to 30 percent um, to reduce the rate of progression of glaucoma by roughly half. And I can talk a little bit more about that in the later slides. Uh, just some other things that can affect the eye pressure are your uh, corneal thickness. So the cornea is the front surface layer of the eyes. So the uh, cornea, if it is on the thicker ends, it tends to generally overestimate the eye pressures, while thinner corneas tend to generally underestimate eye pressure. So it's really important to actually combine these two measurements um, when we uh, check the eye pressure. So some of the newer machines, the non-contact uh, machines, actually have a built-in um, mechanism that measures the uh, eye thickness as well as the eye pressure together, and it will come up with a corrected uh, value, which is actually very useful for us when we sort of treat or try to diagnose glaucoma. And just one last thing is just systemic conditions. So things like diabetes can also affect the um, eye pressures if it's fluctuating, not very well maintained. Um, the eye pressures can also tend to spike or fluctuate. All right. So another thing that you guys um, may have been familiar with is the scans of the back of the eyes. So this is what we call a optical coherence tomographer and OCT. So that's just in that picture on the right there. There are a couple of um, versions of this machine, but they all pretty much work the same way. So what they do essentially is it's a very effective way of monitoring sort of structural changes to the back of the eyes over multiple visits, since um, most of the uh, early glaucomatous changes are more likely to be detected on our OCT. So we're talking more structural changes to the back of the eyes. So how does the OCT actually do this? They pretty much piece together images from set intervals over a period of time 
just to sort of track changes. So we can actually generate a um, sort of trend analysis, which is quite nice. Uh, some additional perks of the OCT is it actually can also measure the thickness of the back layer of the eyes as well. That can also tell us if the glaucoma is progressing at a faster rate than usual or if there's certain sections of the back of the eye that are thinner than usual and at a specific sort of pattern that is abnormal. And that way we can also uh, detect glaucoma a lot easier with this machine. So yes, we can still do the analysis of um, the back of the eyes without these machines, but these advents of the invention of these machines, and they are slowly being rolled into most of the practices that um, do, you know, specialize in optometry. They are in pretty much most practices nowadays um, just to help, you know, with the detection and diagnosis of early glaucoma. And the last one here is the visual field machine. So uh, most of, again, you all will be familiar with what this machine is. Basically, it's that machine that um, you press the button when you see a flash of light on your peripheral vision and you're probably wondering why we do these tests a bunch of times. So pretty much what um, these uh, machine with the, what this machine is, it checks your side vision, so your periphery. It's a very effective way. It is a bit tedious, but very effective way of monitoring functional changes over multiple visits. So the OCT is really good for early sort of changes, whereas visual fields are actually really good for sort of later glaucomatous changes, more likely, and it's more likely to be detected when you're doing these tests. So pretty much um, I do get asked this quite a fair bit as well, like what the difference is between this and the sort of driver license um, visual field test. So that one's slightly different. The one that we um, check for glaucoma is done one eye at a time. So you sort of like cover one eye with a patch and then the other one, and then you test each eye. For the driver's license test, it actually checks your binocular vision, so both eyes. So you won't actually need to wear a little eye patch for that. The uh, basis of the exam is pretty much the same. So you still press the button when you see the flash of light. However, glaucoma tends to affect one eye first and then the other one. So that's why we check in each eye individually. Okay. So pretty much what we look for in a comfort, or like what we look for in a visual field test and the OCT just to confirm a diagnosis of glaucoma is one, if the results are reliable. So what that means is if you know, you're trigger happy or if you're not pressing the buttons enough, then unfortunately the results are unreliable and we do actually need to repeat the testing. And the second thing is if the defects are repeatable. So what I mean by defects is if you are consistently missing the same spots in the same locations, those defects are repeatable. And that's a bit more suspicious for a glaucoma diagnosis. So for a confirmed, or I guess I should say a more established um, diagnosis of glaucoma, ideally two consecutive test results have to be abnormal at baseline. And what I mean by abnormal is when um, the spots that you've missed, they actually have to be sort of like at the same sort of uh, section, they all have to be sort of near each other and they all have to be quite um, dark. So if you've seen the results there, they all come up as black spots. So the darker the spot that you've missed, the more extreme the glaucoma is. So that's why essentially we have to do so many of these tests. We have to just very carefully monitor um, glaucoma just because it's such a slow sort of progressing disease. It may seem very tedious, but it is very important that we just make sure that there is a correlation. So just putting everything together now that I've talked about in the last couple of slides, we have um, uh, elevated eye pressures. So glaucoma essentially is made up of pretty much uh, give or take two or three of these factors. So the first thing is elevated eye pressure. Now I get asked a lot of the times, what is a like what is considered normal or what is considered high eye pressure? So there's actually no set number for everyone. Everyone's a little bit different. Um, the actual eye pressure can range from as low as about eight or nine to as above as high as about 20 and 21, even 22. And that could be normal between different individuals. Now, how we can tell it's elevated is it has to be above a certain level that disrupts the homeostasis of the eye. Now, this, it's a bit hard to determine, you know, on just say first visit, which is again, why we need to measure these eye pressures over and over again, just to make sure that the eye pressures are consistently at one level. And then we can sort of judge our sort of diagnosis a little bit easier. So that would be the first step. 
the second thing is if there is elevated eye pressure with the presence of damage to the optic nerve, then that's a little bit more suspicious of glaucoma as well. So I get asked, you know, how do we actually assess any changes to the optic nerve? So the first thing is like we talked about the OCT. So the OCT takes photos of the back of the eyes. As uh, practitioners, we also have the equipment. So we have a special lens that we use to actually um, look into the back of the eye. And that's the photo down there on the left. Um, that's just called slit lamp endoscopy. So that way um, we are able to have a two or actually 3D, I should say, 3D assessment of the um, optic nerve, which is actually the structure at the back of the eye that gets damaged by glaucoma. Now, having a look at the picture on the bottom right there, I've actually placed two um, sort of photos of the nerves. The one on the left there is a healthy looking nerve and the one on the right is a nerve with glaucoma. Now, a glaucomatous nerve usually looks a little bit more pale than the normal one. You can see how it's a bit more sort of white compared to the pinky, peachy, orangey color that a normal nerve looks like. And you'll actually see how the blood vessels are sort of more spaced out. They're a little bit more stretched apart. So those are sort of the key things that I look for when it comes to assessing a nerve for glaucoma. And the final thing is a loss of sight vision. So if the first, um, you know, the first number one, elevated eye pressures, and number two, um, if there is a significant or structural damage to the nerve, I normally will just confirm that with a, a visual field test. So what is actually a visual field test and what does that mean if I do have glaucoma? So pretty much what happens is as the homeostasis of the eye is slowly disrupted by fluctuating or increasing eye pressures, the nerve gets damaged, which consists of the nerve fibers that are involved in your side vision. So that's why we check your side vision a lot. And if your side vision is restricted, pretty much you start getting this sort of like tunnel vision, which is what you can actually see in that top photo there. So on the left, I've placed a photo of just someone that has perfect vision or normal vision, I should say. And on the right, there is a um, is a sort of, uh, I guess, simulation of someone with glaucoma. That's kind of what they'd see. So you can see how it's a very sort of restricted or constricted view, kind of lose out on a bit of that side vision. So no, I wouldn't say it's necessarily tunnel vision but if it's untreated and very end stage it can lead to this sort of tunnel vision so it's very very subtle in the early stages which again is why we have to repeat these tests just to confirm or just make sure that there isn't anything suspicious going on okay all right so just moving forward here um so yes now that um we've done all these testing now how do we actually diagnose glaucoma so we categorize glaucoma by a type so either primary so um primary also is um split into two types so we have primary open angle glaucoma which means the drainage structure in your eye is wide open which allows the eye pressure to flow out however it's still not open enough for the eye pressure to drain out fast enough, which is what um, high eye pressure means. So if your eye pressures are quite high, it means the drainage generally um, is impaired a little bit. So that's that's what we would call primary open angle glaucoma. Uh, you can also get eye, um, you, you can also get glaucoma in the presence of normal eye pressures, and that would just be called normal tension glaucoma. So normal tension glaucoma is um, a lot harder to detect because usually the pressures are quite low, but and the subtleties of the um of the optic nerves are very very subtly um disrupted by the eye pressures. So yes, that's a very very tricky one. The normal tension glaucomas are usually um the latest to be picked up, unfortunately. Uh, the other types of glaucoma we can have are ocular hypertension. So ocular hypertension is a sub-branch, um, not necessarily glaucoma per se. It's more a secondary uh, glaucoma where your eye pressures are quite high, but it's not high enough to start damaging the structures of the back of the eye. And then we also have angle closure glaucoma. So the angle, again, is that drainage structure in the front of the eyes. So if that gets closed up suddenly, you can imagine the eye pressure just start building up and then that will cause angle closure glaucoma. Uh, we can also get secondary glaucomas, so things like pseudoexfoliation syndrome or pigment dispersion syndrome, or things or like things like uveitis or neovascular glaucoma that can be caused by inflammation and secondary. Yeah, and because of that um, high level of inflammation, a glaucoma can also arise from that. So yes, it's very important for us to determine what type of glaucoma and then treat accordingly from that.
So once we've sort of, you know, given someone a type of, I guess, class of glaucoma, we either classify them either as suspects or established glaucoma. So suspects would be people that don't really have structural functional concordance, which is what I'll touch on in a moment. Pretty much what that means is um, if their uh, nerve uh, appearance or their OCT findings don't necessarily correlate with the loss of their sight vision. So that wouldn't be, um, I guess, a formal diagnosis yet. We'd still be monitoring these type of patients quite regularly just to make sure that they don't fall into that established category soon. And of course, the established glaucoma is when we have patients with the structural functional concordance. So when the pattern of structural changes on the OCT matches the functional changes on the visual field. So yes, it is a little bit easier when the eye pressures are elevated and the structural functional concordance, we can actually detect glaucoma quite easily. But of what if there isn't? That's the tricky thing. So what are our options? Do we treat a little bit early? So sort of like a preventative treating or do we monitor? And we have to consider, you know, quality of life as well. So usually in most cases, structural damage occurs before functional damage. And this is potential this is essentially why glaucoma is so hard to detect in the first place, because patients like yourself won't come in unless they're symptomatic which is, again, why reviewing at the you know, regular schedule that your optometrist recommends is so important. And just repeating these tests are very important just to regulate those sort of uh, baseline values that we've got. So the next thing I do want to touch on is when do we actually treat glaucoma? So pretty much the two things for me for when I would start treatment is if there are optic nerve changes that are consistent with glaucoma. So in the photo that I showed you a bit earlier, if the nerve is a bit more pale or if the blood vessels a bit more spread out, then that's generally a little bit more concerning or suspicious. And then if, especially if the eye pressures are somewhat elevated and the nerve does look a little bit more suspicious, not as sort of clearly defined, I would still, you know, be a bit more inclined to just reduce the eye pressure just to sort of uh, prevents, you know, glaucoma. Now, treatment can come in several forms, and I've kind of just listed the three out there. So in the photos, uh, the first type would be uh, eye drops. So uh, most uh, glaucoma patients are on eye drops, usually every night or twice a day in the morning and at night. Um, pros and cons of eye drops, obviously, it is going to have to be a long-term thing and that could, you know, impact the quality of life, okay? Now, um, depending on, you know, a multitude of factors, including systemic medications, eye drops may or may not be the first line of treatment. So now there is actually newer forms of treatment called um, SLT, which is a laser type of treatment. It's a invasive sort of surgery. Basically, it's designed to just open up that angle to allow drainage to occur a little bit easily. And there's actually newer sort of research studies that suggest that um, surgery now is actually more first line treatment compared to eye drops. So there's lots and lots of things that are being sort of explored at the moment. But um, yes, eye drops are still sort of on that forefront. Surgery is slowly becoming a more popular option. And the last thing, you know, is monitoring. So I know monitoring isn't exactly a exactly a sort of primary sort of treatment, but it is definitely important as, you know, practitioners for us to monitor our patients uh, regularly just to make sure that they aren't sort of progressing from that sus uh, suspect to that established sort of stage. Now, how often do we need to monitor our patients? So I've just popped in this screenshot here of a table from the NHMRC guideline. Essentially, that's just a uh, government body that essentially um, dictates how often um, glaucoma patients should be seen. So essentially um, how I like to do this is if they're a suspect, I like to monitor them every six to 12 months, depending on how suspicious their glaucoma looks. If they are um, established glaucoma, if they have clinically established glaucoma or diagnosed glaucoma, I would still, you know, see them every six to 12 months. However, alternate their visits with a specialist or an um, ophthalmologist every three to six months, depending on how severe it is. And usually the ophthalmologist will communicate that with us as an optometrist, just to let us know, you know, how often the reviews should be. However, it does feel like, you know, it's a lot of appointments for no reason. And you may feel like, you know, the vision's still quite good. Um, however, it's still very important that you attend these appointments for the reasons I've sort of listed above. 
usually as an optometrist, our guidelines are that we have to refer onwards to a eye specialist anyways, after four months of, you know, sort of starting treatment. So again, you'll sort of have to juggle between, you know, ophthalmologist and, you know, optometrist, but you'll soon come to find you'll gain a very strong connection with the co-management system here. And yes, um, you will find that the um, sort of pattern of testing is going to be quite regular but quite meaningful in terms of, you know, moving forward with how we treat the glaucoma. So one just fun final thing I wanted to touch on today is sort of referral pathways and support, just very briefly. This is very dependent on your personal preference, your financial status, your location, a multitude of things. So there's no real like sort of um, clear cut sort of uh, answer or solution to this. So when it comes to a sort of diagnosis of glaucoma and I need to refer to a specialist, I have a few options. Um, I work in a sort of metro location, so I do have the luxury of referring to these sort of um, options. Um, however, I will list out the ones here and I understand that, you know, some other practices or locations may or may not have these options. So the first option is the public hospital system. So the closest one for me, I work in Sydney, so Sydney Eye Hospital. Uh, the pros and There are pros and cons of sort of all of these referral pathways. So I guess the first one here, the public hospital system is more bulk billed under Medicare. So if you're a bit more sort of on the uh, fi financially sort of um, financially conscious, it will reduce the cost a little bit. However, it does mean that the waiting time is quite long. Uh, the other option is a private eye specialist. So those are a couple of the ones that I've listed at the bottom left corner there. Those are some of the ones that I do tend to refer to quite a bit with my practice. Uh, they are a bit more personalized care wise and they're obviously the shorter times or waiting times are a little bit shorter. I can triage the patients as well. If I deem them to be quite urgent, I can ask the specialist to see the patient a little bit sooner. However, cost wise, it does come off, come, it does come with a higher price point. So I've personally heard that some of these um, eye, eye specialists have charged quite a few hundred dollars for those visual field tests to be done every time. So yes, from a financial uh, point of view, it can kind of add up. Uh, however, if you are preferring sort of like a more, more personalized care scheme, then yes, the private eye specialists are definitely handy. Uh, the other options are Centre for Eye Health. So Centre for Eye Health is actually a funded clinic. Um, basically, it's funded by guide dogs and um, they do thorough screenings. They go, You go through sort of all the machines and things like that, do a bunch of scans and you get to have a chat with a optometrist and they will either assess you or assess and manage you in terms of how severe your glaucoma is and they usually collaborate with the optometrists and ophthalmologists I guess it's sort of like a middleman if patients you know are sort of a little bit hesitant to give you know their sort of trust to a uh, private eye specialist but also don't want to wait a long time in the public health system I tend to refer to Centre for Eye Health first just as a preliminary test and we'll see how the results go from there and if I deem them to be quite urgent I'd send them to a private specialist and you know if not as urgent then definitely to the hospital system. And of course, um, our final thing is Glaucoma Australia. So usually there are support services, you know, available online, lots and lots of information, including, you know, when to refer, what type of things to look out for for glaucoma. Everything's online nowadays. Everything you need sort of at your fingertips. So Glaucoma Australia online website. And then we also do these webinars sort of every monthly as well, just to, you know, engage in our sort of patients. So if you ever need any sort of, you know, reference or any sort of uh, information, the website online here is very helpful okay so that pretty much wraps up my talk for today um i do see a couple of questions in the chat box which i will go through at the moment now so i think i've talked about a few sort of um i've hit a few points here so first one was um from uh, so just first, sorry, the first question here is what sort of tests are involved in diagnosing glaucoma? So yes, the eye pressure, the um, visual fields and the OCT machines. So those three things in combination will help us determine a diagnosis of glaucoma. And uh, number two and number three, I might just actually answer in these two together. So why do patients keep repeating the OCT and the visual field test? 
and how often should they be done. So repetition is key here. So usually the first couple of times, the um, results aren't uh, are reliable, unfortunately, and that's just a learning curve and that's just no one's fault. So definitely repetition just to make sure that the results are consistent and how often I did talk briefly about already would just be sort of like, a, depending on how severe it is, probably around six months, I would say, 12 months if it's not as suspicious, yeah. And I did also, yeah, talk a little bit about um, another question here is I've got what is the difference between the glaucoma field test and the binocular driving visual field test? So the glaucoma one you usually do sort of one eye at a time as we check for glaucoma in each eye. The binocular driving visual field test checks both eyes since, you know, you drive with both eyes open, hopefully. Um, we test your vision out of both eyes for that. So it's slightly different there. Uh, another question, interesting question, this one. Um, my vision is always the same and my glasses script has not changed. Does that mean my glaucoma is stable? So not necessarily. Uh, glaucoma tends to affect your side vision first. So your vision that you see with your glasses is generally your central vision. So that's more the macula that's involved. So yes, your glasses could still be working great, whatnot, and that might not prompt you to go back to your optometrist. However, that doesn't necessarily mean the glaucoma is stable. We still need to do those extra tests every time just to make sure it's not getting worse. So yes, I would encourage you, you know, visiting the optometrist at their uh, recommended schedule just to make sure, you know, that things are stable. Uh, the next question I think I've got here is why do patients need to repeat tests at the ophthalmologist after only recently seeing the optometrist? So sometimes the ophthalmologists don't, um, they have different machines there. They like to have their own baselines as well. So um, if uh, requested, the patients can actually ask the optometrist to send the results over to the ophthalmologist if they don't wish to repeat the tests again. We are more than happy just to attach, you know, the uh, OCT reports and the visual field reports and send them to the eye specialist just so that they have a record of what's being done and just that the baselines are sort of at one location rather than the true, just so it doesn't, you know, sort of chop and change and also um, saves you a bit of time as well in terms of testing. Uh, the next two questions I might just answer quickly. They all that the same. Uh, I think I've already touched on them very briefly. So, what is the purpose of the OCT and the field test, and what does it show? So, um, the OCT shows more structural changes, and the uh, visual field shows a bit more uh, functional changes. So, I think I talked about that in my talk already. And the next two as well, I'll also touch on together. So what are the different eye measure, um, eye pressure tests and which one's the best for glaucoma and what is the meaning of the corneal thickness? So the eye pressure test we talked about, so the best one for glaucoma is definitely the one where we, you know, put the an anesthetic on the eye and put the needle on your eye. So that's called contact tonometry and it is our gold standard and most um, specialists still tend to use this. However, in busy practices, unfortunately, it's just not practical. Um, it's not a very... Uh, time efficient way of churning out you know eye pressures so unfortunately we have to go by the non-contact one if we do suspect things like higher eye pressures we go ahead and measure the corneal thickness so again like I said if the corneas too tend to be on the thicker side um it will tend to artificially elevate your eye pressures and vice versa if your corneal thicknesses are a bit lower then your eye pressures may be slightly underestimated uh, the last thing, our uh, uh, last couple of questions here, I've got, uh, do optometrists routinely check the angles of the eyes? So me personally, yes. Um, there are a few ways to check the angles of the eyes. The most common method is using the um, microscope that we've got with the light on it. Um, another way they can do it is actually, again, anesthetizing the eye and putting a very sort of like cold contact lens on your eye. This is a definitely more invasive way, but it's a very, very detailed way of checking the structures inside the eye. So that's something that you can't actually actually see front on you actually have to go sort of like look inside with the lens so me personally I don't do that um I only do that if indicated or if I suspect you know angle closure that's um the um thing that will very definitely spike up the eye pressures personally if I suspect angle closure I would refer to an eye specialist who has a bit more expertise in doing the more invasive tests and then we'll go from there 
Um, I have another question from Sarah A. So I've got, is the puffer machine used by eye specialists as accurate as a tonometer for, for reading eye pressure? So good question. Um, the puffer machine, uh, there is there are variations. So I definitely wouldn't say it's the most accurate. Um, it's the most time efficient. It can be affected, you know, like we talked about the eye, um, the cornea thickness. Um, also, if the patient do, does tend to sort of like squint or anxious or, you know, hold their breath, that can also artificially the eye, um, artificially raise the eye pressure as well. So the tonometer I assume we're talking about is the contact one. That generally is the more gold standard. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I, get this, I guess it's got its like sort of uh, pros and cons. But in terms of, you know, managing a sort of larger sort of practice with a lot of patients, the puffer machine is the most uh, effective way of going about it. Um, just a couple of questions about the macula. Actually, I've got um here. Can glaucoma tests detect macula degeneration, and also the other way around? So, the glaucoma tests, specifically the um, uh, OCT, can actually um detect uh, macula as well because when we take the photo, it actually goes through the middle part of the eye as well, and also the um optic nerve which is what we look at for glaucoma so yes we can actually do them together the management is slightly different between the two so that's where i'll um talk about question 14 so is there a home monitoring tool for glaucoma like there is amsa for macula so the amsa grid as we know is good to measure your central vision uh, home monitoring, this is actually something quite new that's been rolled out recently. It's a sort of handheld device that you can actually use to measure your eye pressures at home. And that's it actually a really nice way for sort of eye specialists to keep track of your eye pressures. So you kind of like log these eye pressures down in a little book and you bring them to your specialist to just check and make sure everything is okay. And it also checks as well if you've been, you know, using your drops consistently. Obviously a spike in your eye pressure would just mean your drops, you know, may not be as effective as they are. Are, and that just prompts the specialist or the optometrist to either sort of switch up the drop or change the drop or add another drop or maybe change to a different type of treatment so like surgery for example okay i think um that's about it for the questions thank you for having me here tonight for the talk um did sarah want to say anything or All right. Awesome. Yep. Yeah. So thanks for yeah listening tonight. Um, thank you for joining in for the talk today and we'll see you at the next sort of uh, webinar. Thank you.